I'd like to call them the meeting to order of the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, at first, I would ask everybody in attendance to please put their phones on silent or vibrate. And we'll start by asking the committee members, members to introduce themselves, starting with Ms. LeBlanc. Good morning, I'm Susan LeBlanc, the MLA for Dartmouth North. Good morning, I'm Lisa Roberts, the MLA for Halifax Needham. Good morning, I'm Tim Hallman, the MLA for Dartmouth East. Good morning and welcome, I'm the MLA Gordon Wilson for Claire Digby. Good morning, MLA Suzanne Lonescroft, Lunenburg. Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic, good morning. Hugh McKay, Chester St. Margaret's, good morning. Thank you, everybody. Uh, on today's agenda, we have officials from the IWK Health Centre relating to the December 2018 and October 2018 reports to the Auditor General. At this time, I'd ask the witness to introduce themselves, please. Hello, my name is Dr. Krista Jangard. I'm the President and the CEO of the IWK Health Centre. Good morning. I'm Karen Hutt, and I'm the Chair of the IWK Board of Directors. Uh, thank you, ladies. Uh, if we could now, we'd get you to do your opening remarks, please. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Hutt. Good morning, committee members. Thank you for inviting us to discuss the improvement work that has been completed and work that is currently underway at the IWK Health Center. I'm joined today by IWK's new president and CEO, Dr. Krista Jangard. Krista and I look forward to answering your questions this morning. The IWK Health Center is dedicated to improving the health of women, children, youth, and families in the Maritimes and beyond. In its role, as a tertiary care centre, the IWK provides highly specialised and complex care that is not available anywhere else in the region. As an academic health sciences centre, the IWK is a global leader in health research and knowledge, sharing and partnering with Dalhousie University and other post-secondary institutions in educating and training our next generation of health professionals. The IWK has been delivering on its mandate in an ever-changing healthcare landscape here in Nova Scotia and indeed across Canada. Over the past few years, we've been seeing higher acuity patients and increased pressures in our emergency department, higher usage in key areas like our pediatric intensive care unit and pediatric medical unit, as well as increased visits to many of our ambulatory clinics. We have been focused on both managing the pressures we're facing while working to improve access to care in these and other areas through intensive improvement efforts that are shortening wait times, improving the experience of our patients and removing roadblocks so that our physicians and staff can be more efficient in the roles. Through these efforts, we have seen significant improvements in wait times in mental health and addictions, orthopedics and dentistry, just to name a few. We're proud of our accomplishments in improving our facilities. Many of our critical care areas have either recently been redeveloped or currently in the midst of it becoming modernized with state-of-the-art facilities and equipment. From the IWK's recently redeveloped neonatal intensive care unit and our early labor and assessment unit to the forthcoming redeveloped pediatric intensive care unit and emergency department, we have been laser focused on providing the best care for patients and families in the world-class facilities they expect and deserve right here in Nova Scotia. Responsible stewardship is a key enabler to consistently deliver on our broad mandate. Organizations as large and complex as the IWK are always looking at ways to improve internal processes and identify and implement efficiencies both at the bedside and support areas. During our time here this morning, we'll share with you the areas where our work has been strengthened and where we are continuing to improve. At the end of today's session, there are three messages that we're hoping to leave with the committee and indeed all Nova Scotians. Number one, our care has always come first. The exceptional and leading edge healthcare that the IWK is known for has never wavered at any point. The well-being, the safety and the care of patients and families has always and continues to be the IWK's central focus for everything that we do. Number two, we have been steadfast in our commitment to be transparent and accountable. The Board of Directors committed from day one that we would be transparent and accountable when the issue of the past CEO's expenses came to light, and this commitment has not changed. We took immediate steps then, asking the Auditor General to do the review and going so far as pointing out key areas of concern, and have since accepted every recommendation in the Auditor General's report and have been, commi have been committed to completing the work. Number three, our actions have been swift. The board and management 
did not wait to take action. We addressed the former CEO expense issue head on and we continue to make steady progress in evolving the control environment at the IWK over the past 18 months. The improvement work we've undertaken reaches beyond the 10 recommendations the Auditor General provided in his report. And I truly believe that the organization could not have achieved this significant progress on the Auditor General's recommendations to date if it not were for the extensive amount of work that was completed or underway prior to receiving his report in December. I'm pleased to share with the committee this morning that more than half of the Auditor General's recommendations are already complete with the majority to be completed by the end of March of this year and the remainder by March of 2020. The amount of work completed to date has been remarkable and reflective of the IWK's commitment to sustainably close the gaps and improve processes and policies for the betterment of the IWK. The board has confidence in the new executive leadership at the Health Centre. They are the right people to continue to drive momentum and results around this important work. Being accountable and transparent is not something that the board of the IWK takes lightly. We have been relentless in exploring all possible avenues available to help us make the important and required improvements and have shared all of the findings and recommendations we've received, good and bad, with Nova Scotians. From being one of the first government agencies to complete a fraud risk assessment to enhancing the health care centers, travel and hospitality policy along with other I'm sorry, along with over 15 other financial control policies to launching and implementing a new disclosure of wrongdoing policy and a confidential whistleblower phone line, we have been aggressively making the needed improvements throughout the organization. The IWK fully embraces continuous improvement in all areas and these audit recommendations align to that philosophy and the work that is delivered each day by talented and dedicated professional teams. Finally, it is my deepest hope that history will look back on this chapter and the response by the IWK's Board of Directors with respect. I am immensely proud of how members of the organization have responded to the challenges that we've faced over the past two years, from frontline care providers to support staff to leaders and my volunteer colleagues on the board. We do what we do because we love the IWK. We are grateful to have an opportunity to speak with you today on the work that we have done and we continue to make the IWK better and carry on the legacy of delivering exceptional care to women, children, youth and families of our region. Thank you and we welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Hutt. We're going to now open the floor to questioning starting with the PC caucus and Mr. Hallman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Ms. Jangard. Good morning, Ms. Hutt. Welcome to Public Accounts. Uh, Mr. Chair, I must note that um, this meeting is proceeding without a, a key witness, uh, as outlined here uh, on the agenda. Um, Ms. Amanda Whitewood, uh, the Chief Operating Officer, uh, is, not, is not present. Uh, I think that is of great consequence, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, especially in light of um, you know, an email I received uh, this morning, uh, because uh, I and my colleagues were under the impression that we would have uh, three witnesses and this meeting is proceeding uh, with two out of the three. And I believe the fact that Ms. Um, Amanda Whitewood is not present is going to be of consequence to, uh, to today's deliberations. So this morning, Mr. Chair, I received uh, an email from the, the committee clerk. And this is what it states. When I arrived at work this morning, I had an email waiting for me from Dr. Jangard, the CEO of the IWK, regarding their appearance this morning. Uh, I have been advised that one of their panelists has become unexpected ill and is receiving medical care and will not be able to attend this morning. Dr. Jangard has advised that this person's expertise would be very important to addressing issues related to the financial controls contained in the AG report. Dr. Jangard is asking that given the unexpected circumstance that their appearance be rescheduled. The Chair has asked that I contact members to inquire if they are agreeable to rescheduling this meeting in these circumstances. I will need unanimous consent from members in this regard. Please contact me ASAP. So as per the instructions, I, I contacted the clerk, and I will table this, Mr. Chair. I contacted the clerk and expressed, yes, I'm of the opinion that it should be rescheduled, especially when one of the key witnesses has indicated that uh, it is of consequence that Ms. Amanda Whitewood is not, is not present for today's meeting. Now, 
it's interesting, Mr. Chair. You know, we've asked uh, IWK for uh, for over a year to to appear at public accounts. The government has um, delayed and delayed that. And now all of a sudden, uh, there's a rush. Uh, there's a rush when it's been expressed by one of the witnesses that it will be of consequence that Ms. Amanda Whitewood, the Chief Operating Officer, uh, will, not be, will not be present. So, Mr. Chair, if a key witness is unavailable, um, I'd like to put forward the motion that if questions today are not answered satisfactorily, because Nova Scotians want to know what happened. It's a key, a key issue to Nova Scotians. Uh, I'd like to put forward that we could reschedule another meeting with uh, Ms. Amanda Whitewood, the Chief Operating Officer, uh, to ensure that we get um, proper answers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's just a decision for the committee. There's a motion put forward, as stated. Um, you're using your time for questioning, I re you realize. Um, we'll have some discussion. Mr. Wilson. Yes. Uh, I, for the record, I'd like to have a little clarification, or maybe if he does have that motion in writing, um, we would like to have that uh, so we could... So I'm a little bit curious. Or are we asking definitively to have a meeting, or if we feel that there are questions that, that we... Um, if we feel satisfied that all the questions have been asked, um, I'd also suggest, I mean, it is unfortunate what's happened here. I don't mean to take up the uh, honourable member's time. Um, we're not adverse to having the IWK come back in again. We felt it was extremely important here today for Nova Scotians to hear um, and not to push this down the road. Um, ironically, we had another That's committee ironic. the other day uh, uh, that there was a request also for a witness that could not attend for health reasons, um, that, that the decision was um, to push that one. Um, and, and anyways, different, different stories for different committees. Um, I, 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 do, I do understand, I do respect uh, my honourable member's position, and uh, we would support that, uh, but I just want clarification on uh, what the motion is. Mr. Hallman, can you uh, clarify you. the motion, please? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm happy to clarify for my colleagues. Uh, if questions are not answered satisfactorily today, um, we would allow for another meeting to be rescheduled with the Chief Operating Officer, uh, Ms. Amanda Whitewood, to, uh, to get those answers uh, to the satisfaction of Nova Scotians. Mr. Wilson. I believe Ms. Mr. Yeah. LeBlanc, sorry. LeBlanc, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just going to put forward that uh, the, the way Mr. Holman has worded this, if questions are not answered satisfactorily, is um, very subjective. And so I feel like uh, we might all have a different uh, version of what a satisfactorily is. And so I, I would uh, suggest, and I, 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 um, I know there has to be a, a new motion, or a, can I make an amendment to a motion? Is that, yes, what do I do here? So I would like to make an amendment to, the, to Mr. Holman's motion, and that is we will just, uh, no matter what, reschedule uh, Ms. Whitewood to come and speak with us uh, at a later date. Mr. Holman? Yep, in favour of that, Mr. Okay. Chair. Mr. Wilson? And not to belabor the point, uh, I think we're, we're making an assumption here that, that we're not going to have our questions answered, as he had mentioned in his first motion. So would it be possible for us to, at the end of the meeting, uh, see how well these two very capable people are in answering those questions and decide at that point? And again, we're not adverse to, to not having another meeting. It's just let's not make the uh, understanding here right now that they can't answer those questions. Well, there is an, um, an amendment, a motion on the floor. We'll deal with that first. Uh, all those in favour of bringing the IWK CAO back, uh, as the amendment stated, please say aye. Contrary minded? Motion is carried. Mr. Hallman, no, your motion uh, uh, is dealt with. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to get on with uh, some questions that Nova Scotians have. So My we'll, we'll yep. all those in favour of Mr. Hallman's motion. Contrary contra minded? Motion is carried. Thank you. Can you get on with your question, please, sir? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My question is first for the Office of the Auditor General. 
Uh, the IWK Health Board, I believe, has lost the trust of Nova Scotians. Uh, it's unclear how long uh, these flawed practices uh, have been ongoing or how far back uh, leadership has mismanaged funds. Uh, in my opinion, submitting uh, a proposed high-level scrutiny should be mandatory after such, um, after such a significant breach of public trust. Uh, can the Office of the Auditor General confirm if something is being planned to the effect that the IWK Health Board will be subjected to a probationary period where the AG's office or another appropriate arm's length committee uh, with financial expertise looks over the books to ensure uh, they are following uh, new practices. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Atherton. There's nothing special or unique scheduled. The regular financial statement audit is underway and we will be doing our typical follow-up in two years, but there's been no different approach for this situation than any other. Mr. Holman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does the Office of the Auditor General, are you of the opinion that given the, the circumstances of this mismanagement, do you think there should be a, a different approach? Mr. Atherton. I don't think it's, it's not really our place to say whether there needs to be a unique approach. Uh, we've done many hundreds of audits over the years with the same approach, the same follow-up, um, and I'm comfortable with that approach. Mr. Hallman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so my question is for, uh, for Ms. Hutt or uh, Ms. Jangard, whoever feels most comfortable in, in responding. Um, essentially, the, the fundamental issue here uh, in my evaluation of what's transpired is that uh, the IWK simply did not do a sufficient job in policing itself. Uh, most of the recommendations are that the IWK do a better job of policing itself in the Auditor General's report. And most of the responses uh, is that the IWK is saying it will do a better job of policing itself. Why should Nova Scotians believe um, an organization that failed uh, should be capable of fixing these issues themselves? Ms. Hunt. Thank you. And if, if I'm allowed, may I, I just add a comment to your previous question around what is different. Uh, there is a significant difference in how we're performing the financial audit this year, and indeed the Auditor's General Office is doing that, and that is a new practice. And so there's a significant difference in, in how we're moving forward. Uh, to address your question, that's a fair question, and, and, and I respect that, that you must ask that. It's one that we've asked ourselves. Uh, the reality is that uh, we weren't without policies. We weren't without controls. We weren't without oversight. We're now in a position that we look back on that and we say, was it sufficient? It certainly wasn't. And uh, unfortunately, we had to learn that lesson in a very public and open way. But what I would tell you is that it is very typical in control environments to understand how you need to get better when a control doesn't work. That is the trigger. And that is what has happened here. And so when we immediately became aware of the discrepancy around the former CEO's expenses, we took action, the board stepped in, and the board told management at that time they needed to move away from all of the issues related to this and the board would carry its work forward. So the board, in my view, absolutely did our job. It was our responsibility to look out for the best interests of the hospital. We did that and the most effective way of doing that was shielding the board from management and not, and not having management involved in that. So the first thing that we did is we called in Grant Thornton, a professional accounting firm, and we asked for their help and then we continued to, to engage others along the way. So not for one moment did we stop looking for ways that we could remedy the situation and to be able to ensure that if we encountered a situation like this in the future, that the control environment would withstand that. The other point that I will make on this that I think is important is that we are working very hard to put the best control environment we can put in place. No control environment can protect somebody who simply believes they're above policies and the rules. 
We will never, ever shield ourselves from that entirely. But we are working very hard to make sure that we have best practices and the most robust controls in all areas. And I can tell you that every single member of the board takes very personal responsibility of being able to leave that behind. Mr. Holm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the IWK Health Board stated that um, that it's accepted all the recommendations made by the by the Auditor General, and you've even begun to implement some of them. Uh, could you please expand on what efforts uh, the IWK Board has been uh, doing so far in pursuit of fulfilling the the AG's uh, reports? Ms. Hutt. Thank you. Uh, I'm just looking for my notes. Thank you. So as I mentioned at the outset, we have, out of the 10 recommendations, five of those recommendations have been complete. Uh, so if you were looking at the Auditor General report, uh, recommendations four, five, eight, nine, and 10 are 100% complete. If you're looking at recommendations one, two, six, and seven, those are 75% complete and we expect them to be fully completed by March 31st of this year. The balance, the last one, the thir number three, and that's really around the ongoing testing of the control environment is something that we have uh, plans to have in place by uh, March of 2020. So there's a whole series of work right now on the, the control areas. In fact, we have stood up a formal project management office. We have dedicated project management uh, resources working on that. They have a full um, project management set with deliverables and timelines and milestones and interdependencies and critical, critical dates, all of those pieces. And we're tracking on that. Perhaps Dr. Jangard can talk about the internal scrutiny on that, but I can tell you that that work is now all being reported regularly to the Finance, Audit, and Risk Management Committee, as well as the Board of Directors. D does that address your question? Uh, well, thank you, Ms. Hutt. Uh, just for purposes of clarity, which recommendations have yet to be started on? Uh, none. Okay. okay. And how long do you suspect uh, that all recommendations will be completed? What would be the timeline for that? We expect so all but one mm -hmm. uh, will be completed by the end of this March. By the end of this March, okay. And 50% and of that remaining one is complete. The balance is expected to be completed by March 31st of 2020. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hutt. Um, the IWK Health Center, it stated that it would have a fraud line in place. Uh, does this fraud line exist? And, and could you sort of get into the, uh, the mechanics of that? What are the policies and procedures around that? Indeed it does. Uh, this was a policy that was passed by the board earlier in 2018. Dr. Jangard, do you want to talk about how that's working? Dr. Jangard. Thank you. Um, so our fraud policy is the last of a suite of policies that's actually in place for our respectful workplace. They include, and they have been in place and we have been updating those over a, a number of years. Uh, we have had in place the entire time of this um, a code of conduct, which does have in it ways in which that you can uh, express and report any issues that you have of any kind. They weren't explicit uh, uh, about a reporting for fraud, but fraud was included. And as Ms. Hutt just alluded to um, the fraud policy uh, is one of the works that we have gone forward with and the disclosure of wrongdoing policy was passed earlier last year. The fraud tip line is actually a tip line that is uh, housed by an independent outside source um, that is a, a easily uh, attained by people by going on to our Pulse internet our, and our website in the Respectful Workplace um, domain. Uh, the number when you put up uh, and ask for it is there, as well as instructions of how to get to it. Uh, we have not had the fraud tip line used to this point, but it is uh, operational. Uh, and is hosted. There are a number of other ways, however, if people do not feel that they want to go that way, that they can give feedback. Um, all, all of our, all of the directors, managers, uh, VPs, m myself, um, the board chairs, emails and direct contact are available for people if they want to report using our, our uh, uh, code of conduct and the, and the new disclosure policy. Um, and there is an anonymous feedback line that is available for our staff and of course there's always a patient feedback line. They're easily available on our website and quite intuitive to use. Mr. Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's been mentioned that Tracy Kitch was accused of doing the same thing 
as she did here at the IWK, as she did at her previous uh, place of employment in Ontario. How is this not found out? Well, first, of uh, first of all, I'm not in a position to speculate whether or not that's the case. What I can tell you is at the time of the of the recruiting process, there was uh, due diligence that that uh, all the typical due diligence that you would expect that would go into uh, recruiting an executive level role that did occur, and and certainly there wasn't anything of that sort of information presented at the time. Uh, in, a, in in its most hypothetical sense, I can tell you that if it were, certainly that would have caused a change in action by the committee. Mr. Holm. So what sort of background checks and investigations does the IWK do for a hiring process? Could you get into the specifics of that, please? Well, perhaps I can talk uh, about the most recent process that we went through in selecting our most current CEO. Uh, that's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, we, we did hire the services of a professional recruiting firm. We did that through a public tender process and uh, we selected the firm that we felt would provide the best service to the organization and certainly one of the objectives that we wanted to make sure that we search for the best talent we could from a Canadian wide perspective and beyond if that was required. One of the key elements was that the successful individual had to certainly understand um, Nova Scotia and the Maritimes, and the importance of, of being connected to this community in a very, very meaningful way. That was a primary concern for us. Uh, and, and obviously, the other, the other concerns that you would expect a recruiting uh, committee would have, which by the way, I, I just want to say that was, uh, that was a large committee. We purposely made that um, uh, very broad. We had representatives from physicians. We had representatives from our clinical team. Uh, we had representatives from Dalhousie, as well as the foundation and members of the board. We wanted to make sure that we had all of the important voices around the table, and we reached out to several other stakeholders through that process, in including perhaps some people here or others inside the government. Um, and so uh, then we went through, um, obviously, an important referral process. Um, as, we com as we converged on to who our preferred uh, candidates were, and it became obvious to us that Dr. Jangard was, um, was our preferred candidate, and uh, we, we still, despite the fact that Dr. Jangard spent her entire career practically at the IWK, went through a, a robust um, referral and, um, and uh, reference checking process for her. So uh, we tried at every corner to make sure we were doing the very best that we could and we think we were successful. Thank you. That concludes the questioning for the PC caucus. We'll now move to the NDP caucus and Ms. Roberts. Thank you very much and thank you for being here today. Um, Ms. Hutt, when did you join the Board of Directors of the IWK? Ms. Hutt. I joined the Board in January of 2014. Okay. And so how many members of the current Board would have been uh, Board members during the time of, of, you know, this audit investigation and the activities related to it? Uh, I think, I can check the number, I think there were, uh, there's about four of us. I, it's in my notes, I can check and okay. just make sure I get you that. So there's been significant turnover um, through this through this period? Absolutely. We have a process where uh, when a new director joins the board, it's for a three-year term that can be renewed for an additional three years. Mm -hmm. And one of the objectives of the, the board was to make sure that we were staggering the terms of when new directors were joining and, and others were leaving to make sure that we had some organizational depth within the board. And so that's a result of normal transition within the board. Okay. Um, so given that you were on the board from 2014, to what extent did the revelations that um, were made both through, um, you know, the, the initial breaking stories, the Auditor General's report, the police investigation, to what extent did those come as, as a complete surprise? Or to what extent were they, you know, was there, was there somewhere in your gut where you were, eh, maybe things aren't right here? You know, that's a, that's a really good question and it's a challenging one because uh, I, 
you know, through my own self-reflection would say that I feel like I have a pretty good gut. And um, we did not see the kinds of overt signs that you might have expected that we would see. Uh, we relied on the information that we were being provided to by, by the management at that time, and that is perfectly reasonable for any board to do that. We need to be able to rely on that. Certainly, we need, we need processes and we need controls, and as I mentioned, um, those, those were in place. We had annual audits of our financial statements completed all through the time that I was there, and, and I would believe before that. And so what happened was there was a series of breakdowns below what would have normally perhaps been reported to the board that as those began to crack and we became aware of that, I can tell you the moment we became aware of the discrepancy, we acted and we didn't stop acting and we haven't stopped since. Many of your comments um, thus far have referred to the CEO expenses and obviously, um, you know, as a at any Nova Scotian would find um, those discrepancies alarming and egregious. Um, but if we look at the audit report, there are multiple other areas where there has been a lack of controls at the IWK. Um, I'm looking, thinking specifically about um, control over procurement. How did, how has that um, whole set of issues been, uh, been uh, confronted by the board, and and how how does procurement on an ongoing basis kind of filter up to the level of the board to ensure that there are adequate controls? So uh, I'll uh, I'll make a, call, a couple of comments, and then I, I know Dr. Jangard will want to add to that. Uh, so um, certainly. Um, you know, you're right. When we first began to act, it was, was in response to the CEO expenses. Uh, but I said several times at the, at the time that we're dealing with this first, but there's a bigger question for us of how could this have happened, and we're going to get to that next. And we got to that next. The former CFO is no longer with the organization. And in part of, of, of that evolution, as we began to dig into these issues, that that Again, um, you know, from a control environment, there's a reporting mechanism that now will come to the board. But in terms of the day-to-day -day processing of some of those activities, those wouldn't reasonably make its way to the board. So we wouldn't have had any, um, any visibility into that. We'll now get that from a control reporting point of view. Um, but as we were going through our work of unraveling this story and trying to understand what happened, indeed one of the areas we spoke to the Auditor General's office about when we talked with them was, we're concerned about procurement. We want you to look there. Please have a look because that's something we're not comfortable with. So we had identified that as an area of risk. Thank you. Um, just a, a last quick question for related to the board specifically. You are a, a volunteer board. Um, how much time do do you, um, as the chair, uh, spend in that volunteer role? Is that a trick question? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, it, it, certainly, uh, what I can say is you're right. We are a volunteer board, and um, and I was chair of the governance and nominating committee from from January 2014 through to June, and I'm proud of the work that our committee achieved at that time. It was at that time that we formalized a skills matrix, we formalized a board recruiting process, we formalized a board onboarding process, which includes annual governance training. And there were several other things that we put in place, including when we talked to pr prospective board members, we talked about the time commitment that would be required in order for them to serve. It's our expectation that directors not only serve on the board itself, that they choose one of our committees to serve on. And the work of the board is very much carried out through the committees. We have four of those. And so certainly we are very clear with our directors around what the time commitment is and the expectation around attendance and participating in the governance matters of the organization. You didn't give me an hours per week or an hours per month. Uh, 
Well, you know, I would say that committees meet uh, every couple of months. Uh, the committee meetings would range anywhere between two to three hours. The Finance Audit and Risk Committee has been meeting much more frequently, as you would expect, and those meetings can last four to five hours um, on a very regular basis. The board meets five times a year. We have an additional strategy session, and um, we have additional, you know, me and my capacity as chair, there's not, certainly not a week that goes by that we're not talking, and probably every few days. Okay. Dr. Jengard, as Ms. Hutt mentioned, you have spent um, virtually your entire career at the IWK. Um, congratulations on being the CEO. Um, is, is this the first time that you sought that sort of leadership role at the organization, may I ask? Dr. Jengard? Thank you very much for the question, and thank you for your congratulations. Um, it, certainly, this is my first time uh, seeking the CEO um, leadership role. But if you look at my career through my 30 years at the IWK, you will see a progressive, uh, a cor progressive leadership uh, growth, which you would expect in someone's career. So, from starting as a pediatric resident through doing my fellowship training to become a neonatal intensive care doctor, to coming on staff in 1996 as a member not only of staff there, but also as the of the two departments of Dalhousie, um, pediatrics and obstetrics and gynecology. I've had leadership uh, positions within my department, within my division, and within the hospital progressively. So I've been the president of medical staff. I spent four years as the chair of the medical uh, the medical advisory committee um, uh, prior to becoming in, in into uh, this role. So it has been a career direction for me, uh, such that um, as I understood that system management and leadership and looking at the broad picture for how we deliver care for women and youth and families um, was an interest of mine. I went back and actually obtained my Master's of Health Administration. So uh, to qualify uh, to actually look differently at the organizations. Physicians as a whole uh, bring a unique, uh, a unique prospect to how we think about healthcare. And I think uh, not the best, not the only, but unique in how we make decisions about what we need. And you heard Ms. Hutt uh, very eloquently talk about what our mandate at the IWK is, and that is to deliver care uh, to do research that you know, brings us forward and discovers new things so that we can actually improve that care and to train new, uh, new graduates uh, it for, uh, so that someday we can retire and others can take our place. So it is the first time that I have been a CEO. I moved into that role, as you know, um, from the Vice President of Medicine role, um, and it, it has been my growth in my, uh, my career. In the Auditor General's report, there's a reference to um, the importance of setting the tone from the top. In your role as VP of Medicine previously, did you feel um, or were you aware of um, the absence of um, the right tone from the top in the organization? And, how, and if so, how did, that, how did you experience that? So I joined as the VP Medicine in March of 2016. And to be honest, my focus at that time was coming into a new role, stepping away from my clinical role. And I was highly focused on the uh, issues that were before me in my medicine portfolio. You may recall at that time we were in the middle of negotiations of the physician's contract. Uh, we were looking at new ways in which we could look at recruitment and replacement physicians for the province. And that work I undertook with my VP medicine colleague at uh, NSHA. And my primary focus was to look at the engagement and inclusion of physicians. So my relationships with my colleagues um, were, were mainly at the executive table, were mainly around the other uh, parts of the portfolio that were more clinically uh, oriented. So my relationship with my VP patient services and the VP system performance and quality, rolling out a new safety program and all of the quality things that we are, we, uh, Ms. Hutt talked about before. So my relationship with that, that group was good. The tone at the top in the areas that I was most closely working with uh, was where I would say uh, I would expect it. Okay. Ms. Hutt. Thank you. I, I just feel it's important for the committee to understand that uh, what Dr. Jangard is not talking about is, is stepping up as interim CEO when we tapped on her to do that. 
And I just uh, want to underscore that when it became evident to the board the path that we needed to follow with the former CEO and we thought about how do we move forward, it was unanimous that we asked Dr. Jangard to step up and do that and one of the primary reasons. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, my time is going to elapse and I do have another question I want to get to so I'm just, I'm, I'm going to interrupt and uh, I don't do it lightly. Um, Dr. Jangard, um, there, there were financial consequences as a result of some of the, um, some of the transactions and lack of controls that were discussed in the Auditor General's report. Um, I have been interested to understand um, if, how that had an impact on patients. For example, one very small program with like approximately $300,000 expense that was cut during under the leadership of uh, Ms. Kitch was the extra support for parents program, which you know many people felt very invested in, real grassroots uh, volunteer uh, supported program of supporting um, vulnerable um, mums in the Halifax area, admittedly not across the region, um, but we know that now in Nova Scotia, we've we've lost pretty much all prenatal support to mums, which is you know also I think quite egregious. Would decisions like that have been made differently in the if there were adequate controls? If 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 and maybe if the focus was more on that experience of littlest little as babies and mums, as opposed to where I think um, the focus appeared to be, at least at the level of that very, um, that very top echelon. Dr. Jangard. So with respect to the uh, patient, the extra support for parents, that program was, uh, was discontinued after careful, of careful consideration by our VP clinical services and in consultation with others and as a looking toward what best practice would be. So the decision for that was not, was not made on financial grounds. The decision for that was made on what are the best ways that we can improve services for the people that we care for. We understand that it was a loss for part of the, the community, um, but it is part of how we, on an ongoing basis, look to say what are the best practices for how we provide care to our community. Um, so I would not link those two things. The decisions are made every day at the IWK about what services we provide, how we provide them, and we do that with the best uh, evidence that we have from sources uh, locally, from research, using evidence and informing them. From your perspective now, as as the CEO, um, what what has changed in um, again going back to the examples of procurement, going back to the examples of of inventory? How has that change actually rolled out um, across the organization and and getting up to you? So again, I would echo what uh, Karen has said previously. It was that not, not that we did not have any processes, but that we needed to improve our processes. So if you look at inventory and su supply chain, for example, is one of the issues and that was raised as a risk by the Auditor General in his report. Um, on a daily basis, we have something that's called our daily safety briefing. Our supply chain person is on that. Our clinical folks are all on that. If there are any issues that are coming forward, they are discussed and they are, are attended to before they get to an area where they can reach patients. In addition to that, we are uh, implementing a number of different changes within procurement. Uh, Ms. Whitewood could outline those for you better. I can tell you a little bit more about um, how we uh, handle the supplies in stores, because that was there. We've increased the footprint. Uh, we now have a visual queuing system that is improved. If you want to get big picture, uh, one of the methods, one of the questions that was asked was about the dollar value that was required uh, to, be, to get approval from the board outside uh, regular business uh, uh, business and that's in our governance policy we have updated that that is now set at a million dollar uh, value and that's not a million dollars a year that's if we are looking at a contract that will cumulatively be a million dollars that we're looking at for outside our approved business plans. We have now a, a process and a documentation that it has a checklist for everything that has to be considered and done before that actually can be approved. Uh, and seeking the input and the approval of the board is on that. So there are a number of different uh, explanations I can give from, from the smallest little thing to the, to the biggest thing. As we have said, they're not all complete. We are, are in, hoping to enter or, or planning to enter. As long as we have no other emergencies that happen on our on our 
our doorstep. Uh, the year, the, the 2019-2020 fiscal year with our controls in place so that by the end of the period we can adequately with our auditors uh, show that we can track, audit and, and look at them. I'm, I'm going to return to Ms. Hutt for a moment. Um, when you came on in 2014, there, was, there were outstanding financial risks that had been identified in 2012 um, where certain lower risks, um, lower risk areas were addressed, um, but there were no plans to address the higher risk areas. How at the board level are you... Um, I guess, how do, you, how do you explain to us that the board was not checking back on outstanding work around con control weaknesses that had already been identified in, in reports? Ms. Hall. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I, I don't think we can conclude that the board wasn't doing that. I, I think that, you know, if we look at the record of minutes, maybe there's an open question over what was recorded, but that, that, wouldn't, um, that wouldn't suggest that the conversations didn't occur. And certainly it's the job of, of an auditor to review their, their recommendations from the previous year and understand where those are. So that work would have happened. What I can tell you uh, I wasn't on the board in 2012, so I don't have the perspective on that, but I do know in 2016, we asked management to move forward with a broader enterprise risk management framework. The hospital has always been extraordinary at managing patient risk, but it doesn't encompass all of the organizational risks that it needs to, certainly in, in a, a, an organization as large and complex as the IWK. And that is when we, we set out of building the entire ERP framework. And that work has progressed exceptionally well. And I think if you looked at that from a best practice point of view, we're certainly on the right road. And that gets to, I think, the bigger question that you're asking is how can something be identified and then not later reported on through mitigation and risk management efforts? That framework now addresses that. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 30 seconds? No. Sorry. Um, I guess what is um, what is the next step moving forward for setting the tone from the top? I'm I'm very interested in uh, in that language in the Auditor General's report. I think it's very important, especially given the importance of um, of the hospital's um, reputation in terms of it it's, it carrying out its work, um, but also for the all the healthcare providers who I know do tremendous work uh, within the organization. So how are you actively working to set that tone for the top of absolutely every dollar being spent for the best interests of patients? Mm -hmm. so. good, it's, it's a good question and, and I, I believe that the tone has been set. And I believe that it was set the moment that the board stepped in and took over the, the issue with the former CEO's expenses. And from that moment on, the board asserted its role in making sure that it was looking, for, looking out for the best interest of the organization. Part of tone, a material part of tone, is taking accountability and being responsible to step up and do our jobs. And we've done that. We've done that openly. We've done it honestly. And we've done it broadly with, with Nova Scotians. And we've spent a lot of time internally uh, working with the physician groups, with the clinical teams, with our back office teams, making sure that people understand why things are happening and what we're being asked. To do. We're asking them to work really hard, really, really hard. But part of the reason that we're doing that is we know that the stakes could not be higher at this moment, that having the trust and confidence in Nova Scotia, in Nova Scotians, in our ability to deliver on our mandate is fundamental to what we do. So there is nothing more important than this. Part of reinforcing the tone was appointing Dr. Jangard and having someone who understands the fabric of that organization has been instrumental in rebuilding employee uh, commitment and trust and, and motivation to move forward, frankly. Thank you, um, Ms. Hutt. I'll now move on to the Liberal Caucus and Mr. Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll be brief and then turn my time over to the Honourable Member for Ch Chester St. Margaret's. Um, thank you for being here. As I mentioned earlier, it's very unfortunate um, that we don't have your full team, but uh, you are doing an extremely good job to point 
uh, right now. Uh, I just want to reflect um, myself on the fact that uh, uh, the concerns I think out in the general public were uh, really around assurance that that care has not been impacted by what's happened here. Can you can you give me your comments on that side of it from the operational points? Dr. Jenger. Dr. Jenger. I will try not to use up all your time uh, by talking about the care provision and the mandate provision because care is a really important part of what we do, as is the rest of our mandate for research, discovery, and, and for education. But since you asked about care, I'll focus on that. Uh, as uh, Karen alluded to in her be beginning of her um, uh, remarks to you, care has not wavered. What has happened every single day throughout this entire thing is that our clinicians, our nurses, our physicians, and everyone have come to work every single day to do the very best job that they can for the patients. So we have delivered in a year, we've delivered another 5,000 Nova Scotians. We've done more than a quarter million dollar, a quarter million um, visits in our ambulatory uh, clinics. We do our surgeries in our women and our children. We are there for emergency. We've seen a remarkable increase in our emergency visits. We're now up to over 32,000 visits a year in our emergency department. And we've coped with those and we've made sure that people get seen. Um, so our care providers come in every single day to do that work. But they're also heavily vested in how can we do that work better? How can we look and know in an ever-changing, complex, very complicated environment where every day there's something new to learn about the care of you know, infants, women, children, uh, and youth, how can we do things better, do things differently to, to deliver that care? So we have a number of innovative uh, situations that have gone forward. We're capacity building in our, in our mental health and our community uh, clinics. We've reduced our weight times by 60 days to have access in the community clinics in Halifax. We've reduced our wait times for dentistry by doing lean exercises where people look to say, can we do this better and more efficiently? So the organization has put the time and effort and resources into not only providing the care, but making sure that we stay current, up to date, and on the forefront. I Many other uh, opportunities, we have uh, I think nine uh, lean activities going on right now to improve access or, or improve the patient journey. Because not only do we want you to get in, we want once you're in for that care journey to be something that is smooth for you so that you uh, can get in one end and out the other without having to do too much work. Are we perfect? No. Will we continuously improve and believe in continuous improvement? Uh, forever as we exist, absolutely, because we always have. Uh, and that will continue. Thank you, appreciate those comments. Uh, to follow on the questions uh, my colleague had around the tone, um, tone is one thing for a board. Uh, this has been, I'm sure, uh, a very uh, challenging time. To, uh, what is the mood of the board? Ms. Hutton. Thank you. Um, well, I'll be honest, if you asked anyone from the community to come and volunteer and tell them that the experience that they were going to go through was that, you would wonder if people would volunteer. And I think that the, the best um, proof that I can give you is that we continue to have amazing interest from phenomenal people in the community who want to serve. That hasn't stopped. We recently brought on uh, new directors. Um, and. I am in awe of the commitment uh, when the time came that we needed to roll up our sleeves and do what needed to be done. People leaned in and they got the job done. And when I say that we do it because we care about the IWK, I could not be more sincere when I say that. This is important to people. The IWK connects to people in, in the most incredible of emotional ways. We all have our own stories that connect us to the IWK. That's why people do it. We continue, as I say, to have remarkable people step up and want to serve. Thank you. My last question is around credibility, because again, that speaks to the foundation of what people look for in government, and certainly in their agencies and their boards. Um, you had begun, and my colleague usually does not I respectfully see where she, cut, you know, finishing finishing in a, a question. But you started to talk about uh, um, our, our new CEO uh, in stepping up, and that credibility. Uh, I think it's important for me to understand why you feel this person's credible to do that job. 
uh, and you were talking in regards to not only her um, applying for it, but taking the interim position. So can you make me understand better how uh, the board feels in that respect? Okay. Thank you. Uh, so just to quickly recap, we were in a situation where we needed interim leadership. There was no question. And we very quickly converged on, um, uh, on that being Krista, if she were willing to do that. And, and I can tell you about one Saturday morning at a local coffee shop where I needed to practically scoop her off the floor when I asked her if she would consider this. Um, and the reason we did this was because one, as I said earlier, there's no one who understands the IWK and the culture and the people and the fabric of that organization better than Krista. Oh, thank you. And on top of that, she's a world leading neonatologist. She is an incredible um, physician who has outperformed in every role that she has ever held, including when she was in her early days as VP medicine. And so we had all of the confidence in the world that we had somebody who was homegrown talent, who had built their career through the organization and would step up and carry us through. Now the other thing that I want to say, because it's important for Krista, is that when we did the search, we told the search committee, do not tell other candidates that we have a preferred candidate. We don't. This is an open race and we want to look for the absolute best talent nationwide. And whoever gets the role gets the role. Krista got the role because she won it. She was the best. Thank you. Mr. McKay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Hutt, in regard to the um, former CEO's expenses, uh, if I understood it correctly, um, when this matter came to light, there was, if I may call it a firewall put between the board and the management team at that time. And um, I believe you said that uh, the board stepped up in uh, taking action on this. Could you walk us through that process of what the board did? What were the steps here? Sure. Uh, so this, this was in June of 2017. It was uh, about a week after I assumed my role as chair. Uh, it became evident to me that we had a discrepancy with the expenses. And it was also obvious to me that we couldn't count on management to lead this process because they were inherently conflicted. And so at that time, I informed the former CEO that I was asking her to step away and that I uh, engaged the board and I asked for permission to form a special committee to focus on this, this issue. And so we had representatives from, from the board um, to be able to work through that. We also uh, quickly engaged Grant Thornton uh, to make sure that we had an independent view come in and, and literally reconcile every single expense so we could understand what we were dealing with. I also at the time engaged legal representatives because I knew that there may be a point in time where the board needed to act in a way that it was protecting the interests of the hospital and obviously we couldn't affect that through the management team so we did that independently. And through that process, the board continued to meet on a regular basis. I can tell you this special committee, uh, we met every single week and more to look at the progress that Grant Thornton was making. And then once we came to a conclusion that of what we were dealing with, um, we, we then brought that to the board and we made a decision of, of, of how we would move on. Along the way, I think it's important for the committee to understand we made sure that, um, that uh, members of, of the Department of Health and Wellness understood what was happening. It was really important for me, to, for, for them to know that this issue had occurred and that they were well aware of the steps that we were taking because I didn't want anybody to be surprised by anything that was happening. Um, we also at the time looked to others around us who could, who could provide us with advice. So we continued through that process. Ultimately, it came to uh, a matter before the board. The board made a decision that we could no longer continue our um, employment relationship with the former CEO, and, and that, was, that was terminated. She left the organization. Uh, she resigned, uh, but she resigned uh, with, without any severance. 
and the forty-seven thousand dollars that was was deemed to be owing back to the organization was paid in full. Thank you. Uh, I believe you said that. There are four committees uh, within the board. Uh, I'm wondering if you could detail the structure of what those committees are and has any of the structure changed since the, uh, uh, the time of the investigation into the, the former CEO's expenses? Sure. Um, just so I'm factual, there's actually five when I include the executive committee, but okay. I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. So there's four working committees. There's a governance and nominating committee, and that committee has the responsibility primarily of overseeing the matters of the board in terms of recruiting, uh, onboarding, education, performance, um, and, and all of those elements. They also have the responsibility, we gave them the responsibility to help us build out a former CEO evaluation performance framework. And and that's one of the recommendations that was outlined in the AG's report, and we asked the committee for their help on that. Um, we have the, uh, I'll talk about finance audit and risk management last. We have um, a quality and performance and quality committee, and that is the committee that really oversees the, the clinical progress of the organization. So we, um, they've been working with the organization through the development of the enterprise risk management framework. Uh, they look at the overall delivery of programs. Certainly they would look at if there is a, if there is a safety incident that, that the board needs to understand, they, that would come through that committee first. So they, they process an awful lot of, of the day day in, day out, um, oversight of the clinical delivery of care. Uh, there's a buildings and infrastructure committee and we put that committee in place a couple of years ago because we had, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, so much work underway related to infrastructure renewal. We wanted to have a committee specifically focused on that and so we have subject matter experts who will look at, um, you know, builder contracts. They'll look at, um, you know, schedules and plans and they'll look at our prioritization of new equipment for the organization. They'll look at the asset management function within the organization. So that's been a really, really good addition to our committee complement. And then, and then uh, the finance audit and risk management committee. And this has, as you would expect, has become the absolute workhorse committee over the past 18 months. And this committee uh, began with the Grant Thornton uh, report that was produced. There were, I think, 17 or 18 recommendations that they provided in response to the former CEO expenses. And we actually uh, through that committee, we asked management to report to us on a weekly basis the progress that they were making against the recommendations. That then morphed into the work that we've been doing with the Auditor General, as well as the other work that's happening throughout the organization. And that was the committee that has really processed a lot of this new control work that is underway. Uh, the control framework, the control project management team, all of that work reports through the Finance Audit and Risk Management Committee and again, made up of subject matter experts. The executive committee is, is really just, it's the clearinghouse of, of the work to make sure that we're queued up properly for our, for our board meetings. My own philosophy is I don't think that the work of boards should be done through executive committees. I think that we are there to facilitate the will of the board and that's really how we function. Okay, thank you for that. Um, You've mentioned the uh, the finance audit and risk management committee, uh, and certainly one thing that uh, the office of the auditor general has uh, made uh, made clear in their various audits is uh, the importance of risk management, risk analysis, and so forth. Um, what specifically has the IWK board done in the area of uh, perhaps improving risk management, risk analysis? <laughs> A lot, thank you. Uh, the, the first and foremost piece that we needed was an enterprise risk management framework. You don't know how to holistically look at risk if you don't have the broadest of frameworks and you have to go through and you have to identify all of the different risks that could occur throughout the organization. How do you then rank them in terms of both the likelihood and the consequence should it occur? And then how do you put plans around it? So then you have to go through a process where once you rank them, you assign owners to that 
risks, those, those owners need to bring back plans for how they're being mitigated. We have to establish metrics so we can understand how that improvement is occurring. And we have to then just go on to an, a continuous uh, cycle of overseeing the work of that risk management and, and, and uh, monitoring a controls environment is an everlasting job. You n you're never done. What you do is as you get into it, you will discover other areas where we need to move forward with. And when you're doing that, it's actually working the way it's designed. So it's a good thing. Uh, in addition to that, they have been going through a number of the policies. So we have 10 policies that we've already updated to give very, very clear clarity around signing, hospitality and expenses, how, you know, how we need to make sure that all of the people throughout the entire organization who are spending dollars know exactly how to be accountable for that. We know that there was not enough clarity in that area. We processed all of those new policies over the course of, past, of the last year. So a number of different um, aspects of that and, um, and making sure that in the meantime, we're continuing with things like our annual audit with, with, with now the Auditor General and the, the other deliverables that we're required to do in order to meet the accountability commitments we've made to the government. Thank you for that. Mr. Chair, I'll pass over to uh, my colleague from Halifax Atlantic. Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with, when it comes to the IWK, a lot depends on its uh, reputation, <coughs> on the brand, we'll say, um, and, uh, and on the public's generosity. Um, as a donor, how do you convince me that these past incidents won't happen again? Uh, how do you convince the public that uh, we have the right people making the right decision and leading this organization in the right path forward? Yes, well, first of all, I am a donor myself and I continue to be a donor. And uh, we know that uh, confidence in the IWK is paramount to the donor community. We also know as a board that it's paramount to Nova Scotians. It's Nova Scotians tax dollars that are supporting our healthcare system. And so when we think about public confidence, we think about it holistically, and that's never been lost on us. And that's one of the reasons why it was so important for us to be completely honest about what had happened. And we did that in a way that we said, we're going to give people an opportunity to evaluate us and to trust us. And they will, they will demonstrate that through different ways. And one of the ways will be how they continue to give to the hospital. And they've continued to give. Uh, we can get into specifics. I would ask my foundation friends to give you the details on that. But what I can say is that Nova Scotians and Maritimers continue to give. And I think you heard from Krista. And one of the reasons is that we've never stopped taking care of families and patients. So did you, did you have something to say? If yeah. I yeah, yeah, go for Dr. it. Dr. Jangard. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that what I would, would add as a, um, as a care provider in that organization for the 30 years I was there is I could not walk down the hall without touching something that a donor had provided uh, through their giving that makes the lives and makes the care that we give better. That is no different. And the donor dollars that have been pledged have been used for what they were intended. You just have to come and walk in our new neonatal intensive care unit to see that, to look at our beautiful new ELAU, um, to you know, go in our, our Garen Center for, uh, for Youth Mental Health to, to see that and to see the ongoing work. What you don't see quite as much, which is a little harder, is to know, because I know, when I need to have an IV for somebody, the pump is there. So if the public may think that those pumps are just paid for and they're there, but they're part of the donors as well as is training, support, and all of the other parts that it takes to have the best people there to be able to use the best resources. We just came off last week a very successful radiothon, uh, and the donors in the Maritimes continue to give right, small amounts to big amounts. At the end of, of, of radiothon, we actually had a call in. We were raising money for baby scales, really important in how much a baby weighs before they go home. Um, and somebody called in at the end uh, of, the, of the afternoon and said, I want to buy a whole scale. It's important. So our community, our donor community, uh, we are intensely grateful for. We are very generous and we're very fortunate. So thank you, Dr. Jangart. Uh, that concludes the Liberals' time for questioning. We'll go back to the PC caucus and Mr. Holland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How much time do I have? Uh, we're going to do 13 minute rounds. 13, 13 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so despite 
all the you know this whole affair I believe being a, a you know a major hit to the uh, to the board um, ultimately the responsibility for what's transpired uh, I believe has to be placed with the, the health department and and the minister um, so that being said you know the auditor general has uh, has noted that although the health department has had the right to appoint two board members uh, it has historically not exercised uh, this option. Am I, am I correct in saying that, that they haven't uh, historically exercised that option? Uh, indeed they have. Uh, indeed they have. Uh, we, uh, we appointed the, well, I shouldn't say this, we welcomed the government's appointees uh, in April of last year. Okay. So those, those two people, those two individuals are now part of the board. Okay. Prior to that, um, you know, is it fair does it stand to reason that there could have been a reduced risk uh, of this transpiring if prior to that uh, those, those board members had been uh, appointed? Am I correct in saying that? Uh, I think I would have a different perspective on that. And what I would say is we are pleased that those appointments have been made. They're, they're two very talented individuals and, and they complement the existing board. Uh, but we had already gone to work in making sure that we developed um, you know, a best practice skills matrix to understand all of the different um, skills and experience and uh, perspectives that we needed directors to bring, and we've um, continued to recruit against that. And so I would say that those two new members complement the existing talent that was there, uh, and we're happy to have them now on board. Do you think it would have been reasonable if those two board members uh, who had um, knowledge and um, accounting and operating uh, procedures would have mitigated uh, or potentially re uh, reduced the potential of, of this occurring? I, I can't speculate on that. What I can say is that we're putting their skills to good use today. And, and certainly as we went through this whole series of events, we ensured that the department was aware of what was happening. And uh, we knew that they were an important, uh, obviously, um, uh, voice in this. And so we worked hard to make sure that they were in the loop. But in terms of would the situation have been different, difficult for me to answer that. But as I say, we, we're, we're very pleased to have them on board now so we know this expense scandal uh, affecting the board it was based on questionable practices that occurred between October 2014 and June 30th of 2017 the AG's audit covered from April 2017 to March 31st 2018 and that's three of the 33 months in which there was uh, suspicious transactions uh, am I correct in saying that there'll be a forensic audit that will be covering the the other time period I'm not aware of, of that activity now. Okay, okay. Um, we all know that healthcare in this province um, could be better administered. Um, due to financial constraints, we see we need to be wise stewards and ensure that the public's dollars are being spent uh, in the most cost-effective way. Procurement was seen as a major issue. Uh, mentioned within the AG's report. Uh, for example, it stated that 19 near misses had occurred in the supply chain that would have impacted patient care in a negative way. Um, what were those 19 near misses? Could you comment on that? Uh, we can get you the specifics on that. Um, that's not detail that I have at my fingertips. Um, but again, I would like to emphasize that procurement was indeed an area that we asked the Auditor General to look at because we were concerned about its functioning. Dr. Jangard, do you have something to offer? Uh, so it, with the supply chain, as I alluded to earlier in one of my answers, um, being uh, sensitive to where we are with supply chain is now a daily report. The, supply, the person that is responsible for that is on our daily safety call uh, and interacts with our clinical directors who are the people who are looking for uh, supplies. And so we have a, uh, a way in which we have immediate access to know when we're becoming short of something before we actually get there. The, uh, uh, the inventory management that we talked about using the visual clues, the increase in space for our inventory stores that are now in place uh, are also um, put in place to, to mitigate the risk for that. Mr. Holm. Well, furthermore, on the topic of you know, procurement, and uh, you know, it was stated that approximately 40% of contracts uh, did not use a potentially more cost-effective purchasing option available to the, uh, the IWK. 
Uh, certainly, I think in most organizations, this is standard operating procedure. I know when I was a high school athletic director, that was just standard. You got three quotes and you tried to get the, the best bang for, for the dollar. I'm curious why, why were these potentially more cost-effective purchasing options not opted for? So let's put into context the patient population we take care of at the IWK. They range from a 500 gram baby uh, to a full size adult uh, woman to uh, teenage males who you know, may weigh 250 pounds and would be good for your athletic equipment. <laughs> the supplies that we need for those populations are quite different than sometimes you can buy in a med pro buy uh, arrangement that are largely focused on getting uh, savings for the average Nova Scotian who comes into a hospital who is an adult. So there are occasions by which we need to have alternate procurement uh, that occurs uh, that gets those things. My patients would have been a perfect population to deal with that. I need specific sizes of tubes, lines, and so forth for it. So uh, as part of as looking at procurement, so looking at alternate and looking at what how we best can leverage, that is one of the uh, continuous improvement uh, activities. So using what we can under standard buying and, and uh, having the resources saved that way so that we can actually ensure that we have enough to buy the special equipment and the special things that we need for our uh, really different population is important and part of our new look at our in our procurement policy. So given the given that there is a need for an alternate procurement given circumstances, were there specific guidelines around those, those alternate procurement uh, practices? There are uh, specific guidelines and again those will be part and parcel of us looking at how we Im improve our processes, improve our documentation uh, moving forward. They are part of the uh, uh, improvements that are happening in our control environment uh, project. So. A former landscaping contractor with the IWK, Ronnie Alberts of the RJP Landscaping, he's done 40 years in his field, during which he has done a number of contracts with the IWK. It was then to his surprise that in the records it claimed that, that it was falsely billed to the IWK for snow removal services in May and June of 2017, as well as landscaping services in months such as November and December 2016-2017. Now, despite having a two-year contract with the IWK, uh, the records also show that he had billed the IWK for a number of expenses that were claimed to have been made that fall outside of the contract contractual time frame. Um, do you have any idea how much these false billings figures uh, total? Ms. Hutt. I believe that that's a matter before the courts at this moment, so I don't think that we're in a position to comment on that. Do you have any idea how it could be explained um, in terms of what you know that something like this could occur in the record keeping? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the, the culture that existed. Um, could you comment on that, how something like that could occur? Well, that's exactly why we're doing the work that we're doing. So the, the reality is uh, whatever uh, and I'm not in a position to get into those details, but um, there's a certain level of detail that just simply wouldn't make it to the board. It just doesn't work that way. So, so the board has to rely on something, and the board has to rely on a control framework and in a control environment. And so it's about establishing what are the key controls. You develop your processes within that. You assign owners to that, and you have those owners attest to the control being effective. That is how we get the comfort that we need and the reliance that we are able to depend on from the organization. So that's exactly what we're doing. And I just want to make it clear, it's, I don't want anybody to think that before 2014 there weren't any policies in place. That's not the case. What we're talking about are situations that could occur. So when you become aware, aware of a situation that could occur, you need to react. And that's exactly what we're doing here. The Auditor General uh has indicated time and again that you know culture is what culture does, and I have concerns that you know a groupthink mentality had uh, had emerged. And groupthink mentality is, as we all know, is sort of that psychological phenomenon um, when there's a desire for harmony or conformity, and sometimes that can lead to sort of maybe irrational behaviors, almost dysfunctional decision making. Uh, I'm curious, do you think that groupthink mentality? had an, influ an influential role um, you know, in the board's uh, decision-making process. 
I think the very fact that the board separated itself from management as soon as we became aware of a potential discrepancy demonstrates our uh, commitment to act independently. So the AG stated that one of the things he would always remember in, in, in the investigation um, from this case would, would be when management had reportedly told the board that the internal controls uh, were working in part because of the internal audit group, despite not having an internal audit group. He stated that he was concerned and no one had asked uh, any key questions. Um, does this example make you further believe that you know, maybe groupthink was a, a, a factor uh, in, this, uh, in this mismanagement? It's a good question. That one's a head scratcher for me because I absolutely have known that we don't have an internal audit group and it's one of the budget priorities that we put forward for the government to consider. Yeah, and I think in, in many respects, um, you know, this, the whole thing, everything that's transpired is, is certainly um, a head scratcher for a lot of Nova Scotians. Um, it was noted that the hospital had extensive spending on outside communication services including more than 135,000 to T. Chisholm Communications, which is owned by Tracy Chisholm. By coincidence, she also happened to work at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, the very same location where uh, Ms. Kitch uh, worked at previously. I'm curious as to the rationale, the reasoning that T. Chisholm Communications was selected. It's a good question. Uh, that, um, that provider was selected by the former CEO. Uh, the expectation certainly would have been that, that uh, there, there are established practices for how you procure services. Uh, if you're going to receive the services of a consultant, then there's a, there's a process for that and we follow that. Um, when we were looking at the former CEO's expenses, we actually, that, we identified that, that as a concern. And we asked uh, Grant Thornton to do a particular deep, deep dive into that because we didn't like what we were seeing. And so that is one of the areas, again, that, that would, be, would have been part of our conversations with others along the way. But the board identified that, and it was obvious to us that, that the rules were not properly followed, and that's, that's obviously not without consequences. And what was the extent of the work conducted by Teachism Communications? Uh, could you comment on that? I, I understand that uh, a lot of the work was, uh, you know, speech writing, uh, supporting some event planning, um, su supporting, I presume, the former CEO. Um, we weren't party to the specifics of that, and um, I'm not even sure if, and this was before uh, Dr. Jangard joined the executive. So this was uh, this this was um, a relationship that was established between the between the former. Former CEO and and that consultant, and I can uh, confirm that 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 uh, that vendor no longer provides services to the organization. Thank you. That concludes the timing for the PC caucus. We'll now move to the NDP caucus and Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks for all of your questions or answers so far. Um, I wanted to, because we have Dr. Jangar here, and um, you know, and with your wealth of experience and knowledge at the at the hospital, I wanted to ask you a, a more general question about healthcare right now, um, and it's sort of uh, it's it's based on your comment about um, emergency uh, room. Um, recipients, what would you say, in numbers, uh, rising to 32,000 last year. So that's obviously really concerning, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about um, maybe some of the reasons you're seeing, why, we, why we're seeing a rise in, in visits to the emergency room, but also in general, since you've been at the hospital for 30 years or so, um, if you could talk a little bit about if you're seeing um, um, sort of trends in in sicknesses, um, I'm speaking. I, I, I'm more uh, particularly interested in trends related to issues around poverty, and I'm wondering uh, if you can talk a little bit about that and um, possibly uh, speak to what the hospital might be doing in general around you know addressing the social determinants of health or public health in the community. Dr. Jane. Thanks very much. Um, so emergency in particular, so uh, first of all, I will be very uh, forthright to say we'll not comment on emergency services for the rest of the, uh, the province in an SHA. Sure. That those are, that's well outside my, um, my uh, foyer. 
emergency services at the IWK, um, one would ask you know, what, what kind of patients are being seen and is, are these patients being seen that are a lower acuity? And what we're seeing is no, that is not the case. These are kids that actually need to come to the emergency who need testing, x-rays, and the expertise of the specialists that are, that are there. We know overall in health, um, the, the health of the population is not as good. You talk about social determinants of health. Um, we also know that the kids that we're seeing often are much more complex. Our complex kids are receiving good care and therefore are home and in their communities, but they do need more emergency service. They do need to get to hospital for things that for children that didn't have other complicated complications they might not need. On top of that, we are in Halifax, the primary uh, primary emergency room for everybody under the age of 16 for, for health issues for HRM um, and some of the, H, the uh, edges of HRM, which is a, a big place. And we are the secondary uh, source for some specialty care for specialists that don't exist outside of, the, of, of Halifax, but need to be seen in the emergency and not necessarily admit it. The other part of our EHS system that we didn't talk about was the um, uh, life flight, so the critical care life flight. We are the recipient of all of the critical care life flight for pediatric <coughs> intensive care, uh, maternal, uh, high risk maternity, and neonatology uh, for the maritime, well, for Nova Scotia, and we do a certain amount of it for PEI in New Brunswick as well. So some of the, the differences in those numbers are just based on our population. We also know that our great biggest growth uh, in children um, it has been impacted by some of our newly arrived Canadians who have bigger families who come and actually have health concerns that we need to think about and, and address in a slightly different way. So. Population has changed. That's one of the wonderful things and one of the things I'm most excited about in this job is how do we actually look beyond the walls of the IWK and start to think about what is the IWA's role in advocacy and in capacity building. What we do know is not every child should come to the IWK. Children and their families and women should be cared for in their communities as close to home with the services that they can have unless they need a specialist, in which case they can be in a region, or they need a subspecialist and they will be here either in Capital Health if they're adults or with us at the IWK. A system, a tiered system like that, that builds capacity and allows us all to work to our full scope is where we need to be. The partnerships that you talked about with public health uh, are not simply with public health, they're also with our sister organizations from the Department of Health, so Department of Justice, Department of Community Services, uh, Department of Education, and we have an active presence at the uh, senior senior deputy, senior deputies table, I think, uh, in those groups to look at how we address the issues of health that are not related to health care uh, delivery. Because health is much more than health services delivery. We're very important, but we're uh, necessary but not sufficient. So we have a number of uh, initiatives that we're involved with uh, at this time. Uh, we're involved in the inclusive education strategy that has just come out and how we keep kids in school, because kids shouldn't live in hospitals. Kids live in their communities and schools. Uh, we have a presence on the in, uh, restorative inquiry uh, and looking at what, how we better break down the silos for health for, for that. And I could go on and on, there's a number of those. So what is the IWK's role in that? The IWK's role is to provide the leadership, to provide some of the guidance, but to work with our partners because partners in all aspects of, of what women is in health, children's health is, are going to be the way forward. Ms. How much time do we have? Can I just ask a follow-up question sure. to that? I, I've, uh, I encountered an emergency room doctor, um, uh, not at, not a children's doctor, but um, you know, at another hospital, um, who mentioned that he is beginning to um, to list poverty as um, as a diagnosis. Wondering if that um, sort of idea has uh, has come to the IWK and if that's happening at the IWK emergency. So what I. I don't know the exact answer to that, but what I can say is our Chief of Pediatrics, Dr. Andrew Link, is a tireless advocate for uh, the health care for children and is very, very involved in understanding what are the social determinants of health uh, that lead us to um, needing to think differently about how we provide health care. So with him in charge and in the lead, the advocacy in that department around what we need to do to think of things like poverty, to think of things like um, long long-term illness, to think about things like the impact of, of mental health that mothers have on the on their children is, is priority within that group. I am uncertain as to what the list of their advocacy projects is right at the moment, but they have an active advocacy committee, uh, which does very good work. Thank you. 
Uh, my next question is for Ms. Hutt. Um, can you talk a little bit about, Mr. Hallman mentioned it a bit, but can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the board um, at the IWK and the Department of Health and Wellness? Um, you know, it, it, with all of this uh, over the last couple of years that's been happening and the changes that you're making, what role has the department been taking? Um, have you, have they, have it, has it provided the board with educational opportunities? Um, and I'm wondering if you could sort of characterize the support you've received from the department around of all the changes. Yes, sir. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we, um, we, we've always had an ongoing working relationship between uh, the Department of Health and Wellness and the IWK, as you would expect. Uh, when, when things began to emerge related to some of the things we're talking about here today, uh, I, I talked with, um, with the deputy and, and at times a minister on an ongoing basis. It was really important for, for us as a board to have them understand what was happening, have them understand the actions that we were taking, and to the extent that there was advice or additional things that they wanted us to be considering, uh, there was an opportunity to do that. Um, and uh, so I think, I, I think really a lot of it was just communicating the activities that were, were underway. The other component, uh, which speaks to the broader relationship between us and, and Department of Health and Wellness is the accountability framework. And so there are a number of deliverables that we provide to them that speak to a lot of the things that Krista talked around, talked about around the delivery of care and performance metrics related to, to that, but also the, the financial performance of the organization. So it's a relationship that uh, at any given day of the week, there's, there's some level of interaction, um, but, but very close, close communication throughout this because because again, it was really important that I understood the role that the government had in this, and we wanted to make sure that we were equipping uh, the government with all of the information that we could provide to them, and, and as I say, taking whatever advice that, 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 um, that they wanted to give back to us, and it was, um, it, it was a supportive relationship. Uh, and you mentioned earlier um, that you just filled two uh, board positions, but can you talk about the, the makeup of the board in terms of, you know, do you have a, a maximum number of board members, and uh, if so, where are you with those numbers and uh, other recruiting um, efforts? Sure. We don't have um, a mandated maximum number. There's a good question when you're thinking about good governance of how, bo how large a board should become before it, um, it becomes difficult to, to, um, to manage. Uh, legislatively, the, we have a requirement for a representative from New Brunswick and from Prince Edward Island, as well as eight representatives from Nova Scotia, two of which must be from rural areas. In addition to that, we have two physician representatives from the two physician groups. We have a representative from the foundation, and, and we have a representative from Dalhousie University. So uh, at this moment, we have 20 members. Uh, 14 of them would be what you would, I suppose, consider independent directors, um, and then the, the representatives who have been appointed. And someone asked me earlier the question of how many of the current board were in place in 2017. It was eight of the 20. So all of those mandated positions that you've just mentioned, those are all full right now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked earlier about the different uh, committees that the board has uh, and the, the newly formed committee, I'm sorry, I'm gonna get the, the name wrong, but the, the committee that was formed in response to some of the Auditor General uh, concerns around controls, is that right? Is that the new committee? That's a project team that has been formed. That project team reports into the Finance, Audit, and Risk Management Committee. Okay, can you talk a little bit about then the project team and sort of the nuts and bolts day-to-day -day work that they're doing to, um, you know, to, to, you know, address some of the issues that, that have been going on? Sure, maybe I'll start and I'll ask Krista to add in. So first and foremost, we, we had continued our work almost immediately when we received the recommendations from Grant Thornton on, on specifically the CEO expenses. And at that time, we, we uh, put a reporting structure in place, as I said, that management had to report to the board on a weekly basis on the progress that it was making. As we continued to do our work around risk management and identifying broader risk issues that we wanted to fold 
into the control work, it became obvious to us that we needed a formal project management team in place. So we have a, a dedicated project manager. We have a, a formal project charter that's been put in place. And through that, a schedule that identifies all of the work of the committee, the deliverables, uh, the, the resources required to do it, and how we're tracking against it. So that is the information that is reported through to the Finance, Audit, and Risk Committee on a detailed level, and the overall progress is also reported up to the board at our through our regular meetings. So, Krista, perhaps there's Dr. additional. Jenger. Yeah, so uh, to flesh out a little bit about the kinds of people that are on that committee, we have uh, senior financial analysts, we have uh, people uh, are in industrial engineers, we have some MBAs, we have uh, folks that we know understand the control environment to uh, a very uh, significant degree, and also have the project management skills to be able to move things forward. So when we're talking about this team, this control team, they're not only working on the recommendations from the Auditor General report, all of the other work that was done so our own internal work that was done uh, that the Auditor General refers to in his report, um, findings from the Fraud Risk Assessment, uh, findings from the Grant Thornton Review, and the findings from the, uh, the observations of the Auditor General Review are all, all there. As you can imagine, um, many of them overlap and many of them uh, are, are the same kind of thing said slightly differently. So the first part of the work that they did was to sit down and go through every recommendation and look at all of the actions that would be required for each recommendation recommendation. They are now all cross-referenced uh, by report, by time, uh, by theme, and by the owner. So if they're around uh, payables, they are handled by the finance people. If it's around procurement, it is our procurement person on that team, and so on and so forth. Uh, we now can have weekly reporting and look at week over week progress. Uh, we can look and see what percentage of each of the uh, re recommendations is complete by report, by theme, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is report it weekly at the uh, meeting of the uh, of that team with a COO and is re is reviewed uh, at the ELT on a regular basis prior to going uh, to the board for information. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the Liberal Caucus and Mr. McGuire. I'll, uh, I'll just make it quick and I'll pass it on to um, my colleagues but uh, as the um, chair of the board uh, you're in a pretty unique role, leadership role, uh, one that impacts not just Nova Scotians, but all Maritimers for the most part. Um, so the board really needed to step up and show some leadership uh, during this chapter of the IWK's history um, to work with the AG and, and other stakeholders um, to bring forward the changes that were needed. Uh, are you satisfied with the response thus far and with the plans moving forward? Ms. Hall. Thank you. Uh, I think that um, you, you said something that was important and that was that we need to draw on whoever could help and that was absolutely the philosophy that we took is that we knew that our job was to step up and lead, uh, but we were also uh, smart enough to realize that every good brain we could have around these problems was absolutely what we wanted to do. So we engaged a number of different people, including the Auditor General's team to do that, but others. Uh, am I satisfied with where we are? I would tell you that it's remarkable where we are. If you think about what we have been able to achieve in, frankly, a short period of time, half of the Auditor General General's recommendations were complete before we saw the report. And so clearly we were aligned on the areas that required focus. And in order to be able to do that, you have to have a foundation in place. You can't stand that up from start. Right. And uh, so I'm very, very pleased. Uh, I, I, uh, one of the questions Krista talked about, the, the work effort of the team, one of the questions that the board is asking management is, do we have enough people? Are the people taking care of themselves? Are we working people too hard? Let's make sure that we do this in a way that's sustainable and we don't overlook the health and wellness of those individuals who we're asking to do this work. And so we're trying to take the most holistic of approach to this because we never ever want to deal with this again. And quickly, um, it, it, you did uh, touch on employees. Um, I have uh, a lot of friends that work at the IWK and a lot that have transferred over from different departments to go to the IWK and consider it uh, one of the best places they've ever worked. Um, and so have you had those discussions with employees about the impact uh, that this has had on them and what 
everybody collectively can do moving forward uh, to ensure that uh, that the the confidence is there in in this organization. You bet. So we, um, I've participated in town hall discussions. Krista has had several town hall discussions. Uh, as we were going through the process of selecting the new CEO, I had regular email updates go out to the entire IWK community so everybody could understand how we were progressing. So we've made it a real priority to communicate and make sure that we're hearing the kind of feedback from people, but you can only get good feedback if you engage. And, and so that's really been important for us and you know I'm, I'm not going to say for a moment that um, that it hasn't been difficult on people you know no organization chooses to go through this and and certainly the way that we did this I do believe that we're going to look back on this and we will be better for this and frankly I think other organizations will be better for this because we've all learned some important lessons around this but uh, Chris is absolutely right. I remember the day that we met with the physicians and they, um, you know, there's a room full of them and lots of really good questions and and one of them came up to me after and he said, look, you guys are doing a good job. Keep doing what you're doing, but you just need to know we're not thinking about this every day. And I, I think that's reflective of how they go at their jobs. So thank you both for your leadership on this and I'll pass this over to the member from uh, Hammonds Plains. Mr. Jessen. Thank you. Through the chair to Ms. Hutt. I just wanted to ask a point of clarification on uh, some of your comments uh, in your opening remarks. Um, you referred to um, chartering the services of the Office of the Auditor General uh, to respond and, and, and assist. Uh, and you'd indicated, and I'm asking as a point of clarification because I may have heard you incorrectly, um, you, it, simultaneously you were able to identify uh, areas of concern pointed out to the Auditor General. I'm wondering, I know that Grant Thornton was solicited to, to support the cause, so I'm wondering kind of like what was the timeline there? Like were these areas of concern identified prior to um, chartering the services of Grant Thornton and the Office of the Auditor General? Sure, so the, the, first, um, the, the first engagement that we made was with Grant Thornton and that was specifically to look at the CEO expenses. Mm -hmm. And through doing that work, it became evident that there were some process concerns. Mm -hmm. and, and as I said earlier, our sequence was always to deal with the matter at hand, which was the CEO, ex the former CEO expenses, and then move on to the bigger question of how did this happen and how do we fix it? And that brought us to, um, that brought us to uh, our interaction with the Auditor General. So we asked for help from the Auditor General. We all understand that the Auditor General has the latitude to look at areas where they they choose and so they ultimately determined the scope of this work that was that was their decision not ours uh, and uh, you know our view was anything that could be done that could help us improve we would be pleased to accept and I think the response to the report is reflective of that mm -hmm. but in the meantime as I say we understood where some of those gaps were and some of those concerns were ourselves and so we didn't need to wait we had the right thinking the right expertise to get that work underway and certainly that is something that we welcome the review of, of others on, but uh, I think that's how all of the pieces came together. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you for clarifying that. And I'll just submit that uh, I, I think that um, I'm grateful that we've had a fulsome conversation today and I trust that all members uh, would be satisfied with their responses here today. Uh, I do appreciate your time and uh, I hope that uh, Ms. Whitewood is feeling better soon. Thank you. Ms. Lawrence Croft. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hutt, um, you, you sp spoke of your relationship with the current CEO. Um, can you describe what your relationship was like with the former CEO? Ms. Hutt. Thank you. Uh, I obviously worked with the former CEO. Uh, it, I took over as chair in in June of 2017. The uh, the former CEO expense issue was already in flight. Um, it was very soon after that I asked her to step away from the matter and let the board do our work. 
so I, you know, it's fair to say that we had um, an independent relationship between the board and, and management. Uh, what I will say, and I have said, that uh, boards rely on, on management to carry out the work of the organization, and there is a relationship of trust that needs to exist between boards and CEOs and management. And it's not by any means blind trust, but trust needs to exist. And I will say that even through all of this, uh, one of the most important things that we need to do as individuals is be prepared to trust again. And so we went to work and we made sure that we had the most rigorous of recruitment process for a new CEO. Uh, we also went through a process of putting a very capable COO in place. And those are individuals who we trust. We know now that we have continued controls to be able to provide additional comfort. But... Uh, we all do our work through people, and we need to make sure that we trust the people that we work with, and that's been an important aspect of how we think about our future going forward. Okay, thank you. So were you a board member prior to becoming the, the board chair? I was. I joined the board in, in January of 2014. Okay, so um, how was her relationship with the board? You know, I know that's a subjective question, and individuals would probably have different responses, but... I think, look, you know, the new CEO came in, um, the, you know, the mandate at that time was to adapt at what the time was a very changing health landscape in Nova Scotia. You'll recall that that's when NSHA was formed and there was a new model put in place. So there were a lot of changes that were, that were in place. And, uh, you know, her job was to help lead the organization through that. And there are aspects of the work that was created there that continue today, the lean exercises that Krista is talking about, which is about driving new efficiencies into our delivery system so we can do more with what we have. That work began uh, through, you know, 2014 through 2015. So uh, I don't want anybody to think for a moment that it was, uh, it was a, a, a colossal failure. It wasn't. Uh, but when the breakdown did occur, it was, it was overwhelming enough for us to say, we can no longer continue with this. We can't repair this. And we don't believe that we can repair the confidence that Nova Scotians would need to have in this. So we had a very difficult, difficult decision that the board needed to make. But there was some, there was some you know, track laid that, um, as I say, continues to, to help us move forward today. So you now have a, a whistleblower's line. Or, um, so this allows staff at the IWK, board members, whoever, to report possible fraud, Julius, activity? Exactly. That's the design of it. It's, uh, uh, it's in place. It's run by an independent third party, and so it's completely objective, and it is put in place to ensure that if anybody has any concern at all, that they have a confidential means to be able to, to, um, to move that forward. And that wasn't there before? Well, not formally, but I will say this, that we had a code of conduct in place, and all employees are subject to the code of conduct, and in that, there was a mechanism to elevate concerns if somebody did have one and where they could go. Uh, for example, if somebody wanted to come to the board chair to voice a concern that they didn't feel comfortable uh, taking to management, there was a path that they could do that. Okay, thank you. No more questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your appearance today. Uh, if you have any closing remarks, we'll receive them now. And again, thank you for your presentation. Ms. Hutt. I just, I would say on behalf of, of Krista, on behalf of the board, uh, again, we are very grateful for this opportunity to be able to talk about this. We know that this is an important issue, and it's important that we equip you with the right information so that you can be effective in the jobs that you need to do. So please continue to ask the questions. We welcome them. We want to get better. And um, we are very proud of the work that's been done to date. And as you've heard us say, we're not stopping. Thank you very much. We do have some committee. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Yes. Uh, just, uh, I'd just like to ask a uh, permission from the chair that immediately following our, our correspondence and our, and our discussion on the witness that I be recognized for a motion. Sure. 
Okay, you guys, you guys are welcome to, to leave. You can stay if you like. You're more than welcome to stay. But <laughs> um, okay, uh, the community business uh, correspondence from the Department of Communities, Culture, and Heritage. The information requested from the January 9th meeting. Are there any comments in regards to this correspondence? Hearing none, we'll accept that correspondence as, as uh, presented and tabled. The January 19th, 2019 report of the Auditor General witness. Uh, the witness is approved by the committee with respect to the January 2019 AG's report relating to information access and privacy information technology projects were the Deputy Minister of Internal Services and the Chair of the Architecture Review Board. The Deputy Minister of Eternal Services has advised the Chair of the Architecture Review Board during that period focused on by the audit has passed away in December. He has indicated that this could potentially provide, they could potentially provide a person who's familiar with the Architecture Review Board and how it functions, and also that Sandra Cascadden, CIO, will be attending with the deputy and is familiar with the ARB roles both then and what changes are being presently made. How does the committee wish to proceed with respect to a witness on behalf of the Architecture Review Board? Mr. Wilson. Yeah, I, I it's certainly a very um, unfortunate situation to say the least, but uh, nothing that we can do to change that, certainly. Um, I would suggest that we, you know, take whoever we have as the best opportunity uh, to provide us with the information that we need um, for that, would be my suggestion, at their recommendation. Any other comments, any other questions, concerns? Ms. Roberts? Uh, I if I recall correctly, and not um, to aggrandize my role, I think it, I think I was the one who su suggested the chair of the architecture review board, and and that sounds that sounds like a, a perfectly reasonable substitution. So, thank you, Mr. Holland. Yeah, in line of what Ms. Roberts said, I'll uh, I agree with that. It is uh, it is a uh, you know as uh, Mr. Wilson said, the best person, and of course at their recommendation, I think that's that's reasonable. Thank you very much. We'll instruct the committee clerk, uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion. Mr. Mo Mr. Chair, my motion is, is this to motion on the witness. No, I thought we'd no, already dealt no, with that. So we're going to instruct the committee clerk to um, okay. So my apologies. Proceed with that uh, witness, and uh, we'll go with that from there. Um, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A little anxious there, um, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion. My motion has two parts. First. After the February 20th, 2019, once the committee had fulfilled its monthly meetings, the Public Accounts Committee will meet solely on topics that the Auditor General reports on with follow-up from appropriate departments. Mr. Chair, this is in keeping with a previous motion I passed on September 26, which states, I'd like to read this from Hansard. Mr. Gordon Wilson, yes. I move that all agenda items for public accounts be set through the Auditor General reports beginning with the May 19th, 2018 performance report and that future agenda sequences for scheduling to follow up the order of chapters, to follow the order of chapters for each subsequent report tabled by the Auditor General with the appropriate department witnesses. Mr. Chairman, would all those in favour of the motion please say aye, contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Our clerk will make note of that, Mr. Gordon Wilson. That was the answer. Secondly, after the February 20th, 2019 meeting of the Public Accounts Committee, we'll meet monthly, meaning that the next Public Accounts meeting will be in March, the second Wednesday of the month following Tuesday's Health Committee meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Some comments to that? I'd like to uh, bring just us back to where we're at. We have uh, had numerous discussions around our committees and we have refocused, um, we have expanded, and we have created new committees. We have a new health committee, and as everybody is aware, there's a majority or a lot of items that were on public accounts that were health related. So we have now, for the first time, as government, created a committee, which other governments previous to us did not do, solely dedicated to health. 12 meetings a year. With 12 meetings a year in public accounts, that brings us to 24 meetings. That still exceeds by far the amount of meetings that are dedicated across Canada to these items. 
We stand out as meeting twice as much as any other public account committee in Canada. I'd also like to note that, as the Speaker has mentioned to us, there are consequences of televising. Those are financial, and we, we aim to find a balance and be um, cognizant of that. Uh, we've agreed, again, the first government to have our, we, we're the first to have a health committee created. We also have agreed to televise that, which I think is an excellent thing to do, but we need to understand that that creates pressures uh, and we need to find a balance. Um, it's important for us to understand that this is a refocus. This is not a restriction whatsoever. We have opened our doors for the general public and the, to be able to watch and see how our committees work. We are following the best practices that have been set before us by the Canadian Audit and Accountability Foundation and by the public accounts. When you, if you go to any of their national meetings, what we're doing is the right thing, bringing in 100% of the Auditor General reports and making that accountability for the citizens of Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we continue with comments, I'd like to get the committee's uh, uh, indulgence to extend the time for the meeting today. It's, it's supposed to end at 11, and we're going to go over that, obviously. So is the committee okay with expanding the time? Do you need a yeah. unanimous decision? No. no. Okay. Ms. Roberts. I'd like to um, correct and, and also express some contrary views to um, those just expressed by my colleague, Mr. Gordon Wilson. Um, first of all, uh, the committees of the legislature have not been expanded, they've been reorganized. I sat yesterday on the Natural Resources and Economic D Development Committee, which replaced two committees, um, which were merged in, in order that we maintain the exact same number of committees. Um, in total of the House uh, with the creation of the Health Committee. It is entirely reasonable, given the, the job that we are given by the citizens of Nova Scotia, that committees meet once a month. Um, practices evolve in legislatures and parliamentary democracies across the world. One of the things that I was struck at when I also attended the trainings of the Canadian Audit and Accountability Foundation is that in fact there is no, there are no two public accounts committees across Canada that operate exactly the same way. There is not a best practice. There are good practices. I'm really working hard to straddle um, what often seems to be two other um, members of, of the subcommittee um, who are trying to pull this, pull the work of this committee, which is so important in Nova Scotia, in in various directions, and and really there there are good practices, and in fact this committee has worked with good practices for a long time. Mr. Gordon Wilson, though he got that motion passed in September, does not have the ability with a vote in this committee, where the where of course the the, the Liberal Caucus has the majority. They do not have the ability to change the fundamental rules of how the Public Accounts Committee operates. And the Public Accounts Committee is responsible for, for investigating, overseeing the work of this government that involves the public accounts. We spend 50% of the budget of Nova Scotia on health. The Auditor General has looked at health-related topics and I certainly hope for the public interest of Nova Scotians will continue to look at the expenditures of health. And, and in some cases, the mis-expenditures of health, as we saw in the case of this, of this topic today. It is absolutely ridiculous to think that by put it, bringing into place a health committee, which does not meet with under the same sorts of rules, um, it doesn't have, where, where opposition members do not have the same heft in terms of their their ability to ask questions as public accounts. That is not a replacement for health topics on occasion coming 
to public accounts. The, the, the agenda items that were voted down by the Liberal members when Mr. Gordon Wilson was away were related to Auditor General, Auditor General recommendations, which have never been called before this committee. The, the topics that our, our caucus put forward were entirely from the November 2017, that's just over a year ago, and, and a, a, a public accounts, an uh, Auditor General's report from 2017, which have never been called before this committee, which the Auditor General has provided to us to remind us, oh, it would be helpful if these, if these recommendations were, were discussed at the committee. In fact, the obstinateness of some committee members is preventing us from doing our job according to agreed upon best practices, which are again, not good best practices, good practices. We have good practices in Nova Scotia, we should continue them. Mr. Allman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have grave concerns with this. We are now witnessing, I believe, uh, to my colleague's point uh, that you made a few days ago, an affront to democracy. Uh, you've, this Liberal government has stolen the effectiveness of this committee. And now, you want to hide how taxpayers' money is being spent in relation to how this committee operates. You know, my colleague from Claire Digby, you know, he talks about finding a balance. There's three functions to this committee. The first function is to analyze public spending. The second function is to analyze and question the execution of public administration. And then the third function is reviewing, questioning the reports of the Auditor General. And historically, my understanding is that this committee always attempted to strike a balance. This isn't a balance. What this is, is constraining the ability of this committee to ask tough questions. That's the bottom line. That's the end goal, is to limit the opposition's ability to question government. I have a problem with that. People of this province want government to be more closer to them. So to put forward this notion that we'll meet once a month, I disagree with that. The, this government has constrained this committee. They've constrained other committees. That's not right. Nova Scotians expect accountability. Historically, accountability was achieved through public accounts. Now, that is not being able to happen because of rule changes. And I urge Nova Scotians, pay attention to this. See what's happening here. It's not right. It's not right for Nova Scotia. It's not right for democracy. And the bottom line is to have effective government Government needs to subject itself to opposition questions. Not less, but more. In the spirit of collaboration, of course, of course. But with directions like this, it's not good for Nova Scotia. I'm against this. Public accounts needs to find the balance between its three functions. Public accounts needs to meet once a week to hold government accountable. And I have grave concerns of the direction you're going in here. This is not right for the province. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I also have great concerns. I have a unique um, situation where I sit on both the public accounts and the newly formed health committee. And I can tell you, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in um, the sort of the, the booting back and forth or the punting back and forth of responsibility about um, who and 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 who who reviews uh, the public accounts and who's talking about the issues that are of the most importance to Nova Scotians, I, I, I just I just find it um, shocking, insulting, and uh, I, I just like I cannot believe we we are here even entertaining this given the 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 circumstances of last week. Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, as as uh, Mr. McMaster last week uh, reminded us, the, it says in the in the rules of the House of Assembly, uh, the Public Accounts Committee is established for the purpose of reviewing the public accounts, the annual report or other report of the Auditor General, and any other financial matters respecting the public funds of the province. 
It feels like as we move forward with all these motions from the, from the Liberal government or the, the Liberal uh, caucus, we are getting farther and farther away from the established rules and purpose of the Public Accounts Committee. And I have a serious issue with that. Uh, I will echo what my colleague said about uh, the, the, the the, uh, we need a two-thirds majority um, vote in the House of Assembly to change the rules of the Public Accounts Committee. I don't even understand why we can be, t or how we can be talking about this right now. And I will also uh, take profound exception with the idea that the Public Accounts Committee would be um, would be effective in meeting uh, monthly from now on. Um, the Auditor General uh, tables ten reports a year, so that's. 10 months of the year, we have 12 months in the year as far as I know, the last time I checked. Uh, but then to call witnesses on any of those um, uh, reports would be another 10 meetings. That's 20 meetings in 12 months. How is it possible that we could be effective by only meeting once a month? Uh, I, am, I, I, think the pro, I think the people of Nova Scotia should be outraged by the actions that the Liberals are taking in this committee to try to curb uh, the public's access to the discussions around public accounts and the discussions around uh, the profound uh, crisis we have in health care right now. Thank you. Further discussion? Okay. Um, so, Mr. Wilson, uh, from what I'm saying, you're looking for 12 meetings a month. Does that mean that the committee would meet both in July and August as well? Mr. Wilson. Uh, I believe my motion is fairly clear. Yes. So it's one meeting a month for 12 months is the, is the motion that's on the floor. 12 meetings a year for Ms. Ms. LeBlanc, sorry. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if uh, um, our legal counsel can advise us about the uh, what's what's actually happening here. Is is it is this a question? Can we make these changes in this committee, or do we actually need the two-thirds majority in the House of Assembly to act, to to make these kinds of changes? Mr. Hebb. Uh, the com the committee can't change its mandate, which is set out in the rules. The member is quite right, but it's open to the committee what they do within that mandate. It's entirely within the control of the committee. So can I clarify what that means? Is this, is this a legitimate motion that they can put forward it's, under the rules of the House of it's, Assembly? It's a motion that will determine going forward, but it doesn't prevent at any time from the committee to decide to do something else within its mandate. I'd argue that, um, that uh, the way that if the if the if the man if the rules of the committee uh, are laid out the way I just uh, said um, or read uh, that th that these proposed changes do change the mandate of the committee or the way that the committee can function we can't we can't address the issues we can't do the work of the committee uh, in the circumstances that Mr. Hebb is is suggesting. Ms. Roberts. Um, yes to my colleague, and I really, I beg the Liberal members um, of the Public Accounts Committee to vote according to how you think this is going to land with your constituents and with citizens across Nova Scotia. First of all, it's ridiculous to think that we're going to be able to meet and call witnesses in July and August. Um, it, you know, I mean, I, I will show up. I live I live five kilometers from here, but that is that is very challenging and and goes against all practice that has ever been carried out, as I understand it. Um, last last year, our last public accounts committee meeting, if I recall correctly, was the first week of June. So you know, I I really question whether this motion it has even be been well thought out and truly deliberated on amongst the liberal members of the public accounts committee. But also, we we do we are we are blessed with an auditor general's uh, team, an auditor general's office that is providing us uh, good work that is working with us, and and I think it is um, sort of perverse and unanticipated um, that from from an urging of the Auditor General that we please call 
um, Auditor General reports and witnesses in response to Auditor General reports that we would somehow arrive at a point where we are going to constrain the number of meetings that we hold to such an extent that we will effectively not be able to to respond to that initial request which got Mr. Gordon Wilson, you know, with a bee in his bonnet. Um, it, it, it is absolutely ridiculous. Mr. Hallman. To my colleague's point, you need to reconsider this. Stop and think. This is not the path forward. For us to get the best public policy, to get the best laws, we, government needs to be scrutinized. And limiting the scope, limiting the timing of this is not the best pa path forward for Nova Scotia. So you've constrained this committee as to the topics and witnesses we can bring forward. You've now put forward a motion that we will constrain the amount of time in which this committee can meet. The next question is, what's next? I mean, that's called political incrementalism. What's next? Where do you take us? What, at what point do we go over the, the cliff? This isn't right. You need, you need to reconsider uh, this motion. It is not in the public's interest to, um, to, to move in this direction where we constrain um, the scope of this committee and we constrain the committee to meeting uh, once a month when this committee historically has done great work for the people of Nova Scotia. Mr. Roberts. Just to quickly also remind um, the members that the establishment of the health committee was supported by all members of the house. It was, it was by, by a three party agreement. It was with the understanding that it would be in addition to the public accounts committee, that it would be um, complementary to the work that has a long tradition at the public accounts committee. Um, and, and I really feel like this is um, this is the sort of move that, that honestly it feels like it feels like a dirty trick. That that our our agreement to the establishment of the health committee at this juncture, if this motion were to pass, unparliamentary language is not permitted even in the uh, public accounts committee. Please, I will withdraw that particular okay. phrase. Mr. Chair, would you please ask officially recognize that. The word dirty is unparliamentary. Will you rephrase that for me, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It seems to me that at this juncture, our agreement to and support of establishment of the Health Committee would have been gained by a misleading idea of what we were proceeding with. We, we supported, and I think there's been long discussion about the need for a Health Committee uh, given again that it is 50% of our um, our provincial expenditures are approaching that, um, but it was to be in addition to the work of the public accounts committee. And just a last point, one of the th one of the really striking um, conversations that I had when I did attend the Canadian Audit and Accountability Foundation uh, training in in PEI was when I I sat for a time with. Um, I think it was the co-chair, maybe it was the chair of the Manitoba Public Accounts Committee. That committee, the, the chair and the co-chair were there from two different parties. The committee had actually not met in maybe approaching a year, maybe since the last election. I, I can't recall exactly the time because the goodwill at that committee had been so eroded. This committee, for it to function, for us to do our work for Nova Scotia, we require a certain amount of collaboration. We require a certain amount of respect for each other. And that, with this motion, has been eroded significantly on top of the many others that we have had to debate and frankly go down to defeat on um, from, from where I sit. Mr. Holland. So let's be clear, today the Liberal government took the unprecedented step of hiding from Nova Scotians how taxpayer money is being spent. It is a continuation of a disturbing trend of secrecy the Liberals are imposing on government. 
Liberal members of public accounts already forced changes on the committee that make the once powerful committee look more, uh, look more than a toothless tiger. Today they flex their muscles to reduce the number of committee meetings from four per month to 12 per year. This is an outrageous act of arrogance from a secretive government that does not like to be scrutinized. It makes me wonder what the Liberals are hiding. Ms. LeBlanc. No further discussion. Mr. Wilson, I'll get you to read your motion again and we'll have a vote. Yes, time, Mr. Please. Chair, I can table it for you also. One minute, please. So first, after the February 20th, 2019, once the committee has fulfilled its monthly meetings, the Public Accounts Committee will meet solely on topics that the Auditor General reports on, with follow-up with the appropriate department. Mr. Chair, this is in keeping with a previous motion I passed September 26, which states, and this is the Hansard, Mr. Gordon Wilson, yes, I move that all agenda items for public accounts be set through the Auditor General reports, beginning with the May 29, 2018 performance report, and that future agenda sequences for scheduling to follow up the order of the chapters. To follow the order of chapters for each subsequent report tabled by the Auditor General with the appropriate department witnesses. Mr. Chairman, uh, would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Our clerk will make note of that. Mr. Gordon Wilson, that's the end of the answer. Secondly, after the February 20th, 2019 meeting, the Public Accounts meeting uh, Public Accounts Committee will meet monthly. Meeting at the Public Accounts meeting will be in March, the second Wednesday of the month following Tuesday's Health Committee meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All those in favour of the motion? There's been a call for recorded vote. We'll start the vote now. Mr. McKay. Aye. Mr. McGuire. Yay. Mr. Jessen. Yay. Ms. Lonescroft? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Yes. Mr. Holloman? No. Ms. LeBlanc? Ms. Roberts, sorry? No. Ms. LeBlanc? No. And myself, I would say no. Motion is carried. That concludes committee business. Uh, next meeting will be February the 13th in the legislative chamber from 9 to 11 with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. Meeting adjourned.